not sure if you can relate to this at all, but whenever I decided to quit my day job and go freelance full time, one of the first things that people would say to me is, well, Latasha, don't you ever want to own a home? You're going to kiss your dreams of homeownership goodbye by going freelance. No one's going to want to give a mortgage to somebody who is just freelancing. Well, if you are watching on YouTube, at least you see that we are in a new environment today. And that is because we're in my very first home, which is super exciting. I am here as proof to let you know that you absolutely can buy a house as a freelancer. And like, I've just been given a lot of really bad advice about buying a home. So I'm going to break it all down. Of course, this is not financial advice. I'm just a normal person figuring this stuff out. So this is just my experience and what worked for me, but I did buy a home as a full-time freelancer, so it is absolutely more than possible. Before we get into the content though, I wanna take a second to thank today's sponsor, which is my friends over at Descript. Descript is the tool that I use to share little cut downs of this podcast every single week across my Instagram and my LinkedIn and TikTok and everywhere else that I like to post content. In short, Descript is what you get when you build audio and video editing software from scratch in the era of AI. It lets you edit your audio by editing the transcript just like you would edit a Word doc. So this is super user friendly if you are not a video editor or audio editor and you're just looking to kind of add some text, add some captions, make a little bit of magic where you can. So I will leave a link for Descript down in the show notes in the description box on YouTube. Highly recommend if you are any type of creator, podcaster, video content creator, even if you just do like long form content like webinars and you want to be able to share it on social, all the things. It is amazing and I love it. Okay, so first things first, when I first decided that I wanted to buy a house, let's actually go back a little bit. One of the things that I knew I needed to do is clean up my credit a little bit or you know, make sure that I wasn't doing anything wild with my credit. I've done a couple of videos on credit from a personal finance perspective on this channel, so I'll link those. I won't get too much into that in this episode, but uh, yeah, that is something that I needed to do. I also have talked before about not spending too much in your business. And this is really where this comes in as well. If I make, let's just say I made a million dollars, but I spent $995,000 on contractors, on camera equipment, on trips, on you know all these things, well then I'm actually not very profitable at all. So it's always been very important to me to make sure that my business expenses are very conservative, at least up until the point where I was buying a house. So that was all the pre pre-mortgage stuff. The other thing you're gonna wanna keep in mind is that you are going to need two years of everything. So two years of your tax returns. If you are a W-2 employee, this episode will probably hopefully be a little bit helpful for you too. Obviously I'm speaking directly to freelancers, but if you're a W-2 employee, you'll need two years of that same job or that same industry. So keep that in mind. So that's why I bought when I did because I have been freelancing full time. I think it's been over three years by now. Now, once I hit all of those criteria, I went in to get a pre-qualification. Now, a pre-qualification is not a pre-approval. There are two different things. A pre-qualification is much less intense. It's much less personal. So I just went with a lender that I'd already worked with. I used them for my car loan. My car's paid off, but I did finance it when I first bought it. And I just figured like they know that I'm a good, you know, borrower and let me see if they will pre-qualify me. So they did. They were able to pre-qualify me based on my income, based on my assets, both for personal and business. So income is pretty straightforward. Any money that I made, my salary that I take from my company, and then my assets, which would be my business bank accounts, my personal bank accounts, any like um, investment accounts, savings accounts. I don't really have a ton of assets. I don't own other property, anything like that. But if I did, they would take all of that into account. Now, I do want to add this in because this is something that I was a little worried about throughout the whole process is my salary. I do take a salary from my business. I am the sole owner of my company. So all of my business assets are mine and mine only, you know, my business bank accounts, anything that's in there, that is all mine. However, what I make on paper is actually really, really like 
low end of average, to be honest. Like my salary that I take is pretty low. And I wasn't sure if I should give myself a raise before I start doing this. I wasn't sure how that was going to look, but they did like, I I am in a home, so it all worked out. Um, And I don't think it mattered as much as I was worried about it mattering. So that's something that maybe you could ask your accountant about. They can probably advise you a little bit better than, you know, I can, but that was something that turned out to be kind of a non-issue. And then they also needed my tax returns. So at this point, I think I was giving them my 2019 and my 2020 tax returns because this was in late 2021 that I was applying. So obviously my 2021 tax returns hadn't been completed yet. So they gave me a pre-qualification. They said, yep, you look like you are a qualified lender based on all of those factors. And here's how much we are pre-qualifying you for. And I'm gonna be honest with you, the number the number was a little shocking to me in a good way i suppose like i was overwhelmed by the number and i'm not saying this as a flex i'm saying this because you know mortgage companies any type of creditor they are going to try to stretch you to the maximum they want you to spend as much as they can get you to spend because that is going to be interest and money for them so just keep that in mind again not professional advice here but like I operate on a frugal kind of lifestyle when I can. So when I saw that number, I knew that I was going to set my max budget for shopping at like half of that. Really, if I could get a third, I would be really happy. And I think my home actually did end up being about a third of what they pre-qualified me for. So just keep that in mind, just because you can buy it doesn't mean you necessarily should. Oh, and I also want to mention that this was a question that came in on Instagram as well. Did I purchase with somebody? So for the purpose of this video, when I am talking about purchasing our house, my house, whatever, it is based off of my everything. The reason for this is because one, my job is creating content that helps educate freelancers. And so part of me wanted to just see if it was possible and go through this experience so that I could help you all out. So I did wanna see if I could do it on my own. And number two, here's the thing. Let's say that your partner has a 760 credit score and you have an 800 credit score. The lenders, they're gonna go off of the lowest credit score. They're not gonna combine them and get an average and all this stuff. They're gonna go off the lowest credit score. So even though those are two, I think those are two good credit scores, I would still wanna go off of the highest credit score because that is going to help you get the lowest interest rate and all of that stuff. So you can put somebody else on your mortgage. So keep that in mind, just because you use your own financial documents or whatever financial situation doesn't mean that somebody else can't own the house with you. They absolutely can be on like the deed and all that stuff. You're just not going to use their finances. So that is the answer to that question. So once you get your pre-qualification, that's when you can actually start shopping for houses. That part was the exhausting part. And I won't spend too much time on this because I know it's like not really what you're here for, I don't think. But um, for us, we decided to build. We did like a semi-custom build. The reason for that was honestly convenience. The market, I'm pretty sure it's still pretty wild, but especially when we were purchasing, it was wild. It was out of control. You know, it would be like we would see a house and our realtor is like, okay, so you have to put in an offer like right now. And this is my first time owning a home and it's just a big purchase. And we would go see houses and they, there would be people lined up to go after. There were like realtor wars going on. Like people were like, um, my couple needs to see this. Like it was just too intense. And for my personality like that is just not how I roll so we decided to go with a semi-custom new build the other thing that I'll say like the the bit of personal advice is just to like really narrow down your location I think for me like location was really number one I needed to be in a place where I felt safe but also that had a lot of diversity in a lot of different ways Uh, that was one of like the number one things I wanted multiculturalism I wanted you know diversity of thought I wanted all kinds of different people that was very very important to me. Uh, So that really narrowed it down to like two cities or towns really in our area. And then we could really hone in on new communities in that way. So once we found a house, we found a builder that we liked, in order to go under contract, that's what it's called when you're building, we had to get a pre-approval. Now a pre-approval is done through your actual lender who you're gonna choose to go through. And this is um, basically gives you conditional approval. Like it means you're approved for the loan 
assuming nothing changes, you know, and for the worse, you don't, you know, lose all your money, spend all your money, wreck your credit, that kind of thing. So for that, what they asked for were all of the same things. They asked for, you know, my income, my assets for both my person and my corporation. They also asked for my tax returns, both for corporation and personal. And then they also asked for a third document, which was my profit and loss statement. Now, they originally just asked for my tax returns and my income and, you know, that kind of stuff. But my 2019 tax return was like, okay, like the revenue or the profit that I had on that tax return was like, okay, it was fine. It wasn't bad. It was good. It was a good year. But 2020 was like really good. And then uh, 2021 was also really good, but it wasn't done yet. And the reason they asked for my profit and loss is because those two tax returns, 2019 and 2020, were so vastly different. Not vastly, but like they were quite there. You know, it was like getting a significant raise. They wanted to make sure that my current year, where was it? Was it more like 2019 or was it more like 2020 or was it even better? So they asked me for that additional document just to get some clarity so they could make sure that they were pre-approving me for the right amount. Okay, and then that was pretty much it. Then we had conditional approval. We went under contracts. So for us, for building, we had to do what's called uh, earnest money. I think you'd give earnest money for any type of home purchase, but we basically made like a deposit and it goes towards your closing costs and all of that stuff. I wanna say it was like $20,000 that we had to produce to go under contract and actually secure our lot. And then that would be applied to our closing costs and things like that. After that, we were officially under contract and then it was just a lot of waiting, a lot of waiting, a lot of driving and checking out the lot and you know, just waiting. Then when it came to closing week, they actually produced like the official documents. Obviously we had like all of our inspections and all of that stuff, but from a financial perspective, they asked me for my completed 2021 returns because again, they weren't done yet as of August, 2021 when I applied. So I had those done. So it's really important if you're a freelancer that you are on top of your taxes because we closed in May of 2022. They started asking for these, you know, these finalized documents like in April or early May of 2022. So if I would have filed for an extension or anything like that, I could have really messed myself up. So I had to like, I made sure to get my taxes done as soon as possible. And then they also asked me for one more profit and loss statement because again, we were so far into the new year. And then lastly, they asked me for invoices. Now, this was something else that kind of threw me for a loop. Actually, they asked for one other document too, but the invoices kind of confused me because I don't take invoices, like I don't just do full service work anymore. I do have some full service contracts and monthly invoices that come in from full service work, meaning I invoice a client and they pay it, <laughs> you know? Um, but a lot of my income also comes from like YouTube, for example, Google AdSense. It comes from, uh, you know, Stripe, like course sales and membership sales, PayPal, that kind of stuff. So I was like, what is, what does this mean? So I actually just emailed my bookkeeper and they were able to produce a file for me that had all of my PDFs for PayPal, for Stripe, for any payment processor, any way that I take in money. Basically, they were able to help me with a PDF of all of those itemized transactions. And my lender just asked for two months of invoices. And basically, they just want to make sure that you know, what you say you're making is real money and that it's coming from like a legitimate source, I suppose. They also asked me to document one large transaction. So if you have, a, I don't know how they categorize a large transaction to be honest, but I think I had a transfer of like $10,000 at the end of the year that I, it was part of a bonus that I paid myself or something like that. It was like a $10,000 transfer to and from my accounts, from my business account to my personal account. So they just asked me to verify that that money was cleared and what it was for. So same thing, if you're getting any large gifts, you know, if you get married and you get like a large amount of money or something like that, you'll need to actually document that and they may not include that as a part of your assets when it comes to time to closing. The last document they asked me for at closing was like right before, it was probably four days before we closed. So this did really stress me out because 
I was terrified they were going to be like, no, nope, we changed our minds. You actually are not qualified for this because they, they said like, you know, because of your self-employment income, we just want to get a clear picture of your finances or something like that. So they actually asked me to go to the IRS website and download some files. I'll put up on the screen what exactly they were called. I had to log into my IRS account, which I actually didn't really have access to. Again, my, my accountant took care of that for me. So I was able to just dig through my accountant's file and find my login and stuff for the IRS website and get them what they needed. It was pretty easy, but it was a little stressful because I didn't really know what it was. And essentially it was just a document that listed all of the money I paid to the IRS over the past couple of years, all of my money that was reported as income and just another like income verification essentially. And that was it. We just had to then, you know, produce the rest of the closing costs and all of that stuff. So yeah, honestly, it was, I, I wanna say it was easier than I thought it would be. You know, the way people made it seem was that it was impossible to get a mortgage as a freelancer, that you were just gonna be in this paperwork nightmare. But if I can give you advice, or again, this is not technical financial advice, but just like, person to person, you know, my experience is investing in professionals when it comes to the finance side of your business. If that is not your strong suit, which it is not mine, it pays off for stuff like this. Because, you know, when I did have a quick question about a file or an IRS thing or a profit and loss or whatever, my bookkeeper was able to produce it for me so quickly and easily. And even just having my books up to date, having my taxes up to date, those things all really, really helped me. And they probably will help you as well. Instead of being like super unorganized and not knowing how much money you made and not knowing what, you know, all of that stuff is so, so important. I did ask on Instagram if anybody has any questions specifically about, you know, buying a home as a freelancer. And there was really just one question that came in that I, I haven't covered throughout the duration of this podcast. This is from Valerie.virtual. She says, I'm so excited for you. Did you guys buy together? Also, did you get an FHA or government loan or just pay cash? This is a really great question. I think I already addressed the buying together uh, question. So for the financial perspective, this was done 100% through self-employment income and all of that stuff. I did always know that, you know, he has a traditional job, like a normal quote unquote salary job. So he did always know if we did run into a hiccup, if they were like, you know what, we can't verify this self-employment income that we could put him on and probably get approved that way. It's just, I had a little bit of a better credit score and I just wanted to see if I could do it so I could report on this for you. That was one of the big reasons. The second question, did you get an FHA or government loan or just pay cash? Um, I have mentioned before on my social media that I my goal was just to save money and just buy pay cash for a home. That was a while ago before I had really done a lot of like personal finance research and discovery. And also the market was different. Things are way more expensive. I could have still made that a goal. I could have still done that. However, I learned from some people who know what they're talking about, that's probably not the wisest financial decision. One from a liquid asset, you know, a liquid cash uh, perspective, you don't wanna have all your liquid assets like so dumped into a house, just in case something ever happened in your life, in your business, whatever. But also from like a credit perspective, you know, paying off a mortgage can be good for your credit and things like that. So after talking to a few people who I trust, when it comes to finances, I decided that wasn't the smartest idea for me. And then the type of loan that we got was just a conventional mortgage. So there are a few different kinds and FHA is great if you have a lower credit score. I I don't know the exact credit score I have and it's changed, you know, it will be impacted by getting a mortgage and stuff like that. But I think when I applied, I think I had a high seven. I think it was pretty close to eight if I'm not mistaken. So it was a pretty good credit score, I would say. So I qualified for a conventional, but if you have a lower credit score, let me just look it up really quick. I think a conventional, yes. Okay, so a conventional loan to qualify for that, you have to have a credit score of 620. And what a conventional allows you to do as well is put down a lower down payment if you want to. An FHA, you can have a lower credit score 
but you're going to pay higher interest and mortgage insurance, I'm pretty sure. Again, I'm not an expert at this, so definitely talk to like your lender, talk to your realtor, whoever. They can probably give you some good advice on which one to apply for or which one you'll qualify for. And you'll get this in your pre-qualification and your pre-approval information. They'll tell you what you qualify for. And then a government loan, I think you might be referring to like a USDA loan. Maybe if you're looking somewhere rural, that's a good thing to check out as well. Cause there are different, I don't know all of the requirements for that, but you can look into that. We're not really r- r- rural. We're like kind of border of rural and suburban. So this is not USDA qualified land or whatever. Um, also one last thing that I want to say about buying cash. I still plan to pay off my mortgage much quicker than you know, they tell me I have to. So this is something to keep in mind too, if you're like me and you're like, you know, I really like to live pretty debt free or low debt at least. You do not have to take 30 years to pay off your mortgage. You can make extra payments. So I haven't decided exactly, I need to wait until I get all of my monthly expenses and stuff figured out. I haven't decided exactly how I'm gonna do this, if I'm gonna double up mortgage payments or if I'm just gonna pay like one big, you know, bonus mortgage payment at the end of every year or what exactly I'm gonna do, but I'm absolutely going to be paying more so that I can pay it off faster. So that's also an option for you if you're like me and you're like, I don't wanna be in debt forever. You don't have to be, you can always pay more money towards your mortgage and pay it off faster. So I think those were all the questions. I hope this gave you some clarity and maybe took a little weight off of you. Thanks so much for tuning in. I hope this was helpful. If it was, please leave me a comment. Let me know. Let me know if you have any other questions as well. And also I do plan to do more of the behind the scenes of moving and just kind of like the fun, lighthearted content on my Instagram, maybe on TikTok as well. I'm at the Latasha James and both. So I'll be sharing that. I will share my office transformation here on this channel. If you want to see any more moving or decor videos or whatever on this channel, let me know, but I'll probably keep them mostly to social media. And thank you so much for tuning in. Bye.